the history of this is that Paul had already set up a church in Corinth and then went on to do other, set up other way, other churches, ended up in jail. And in the meantime, they kind of backslided. That's exactly right. That's exactly okay. right. Is that this is not, uh, the, this is Paul's writing from, uh, I think we talked about he's writing from Ephesus here. Yes. I think I'm out of this, honey, and this is what he wants. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, he looks like his dad. Uh, that, that on Paul's missionary journey, Paul is traveling about 25 years after Jesus. Um, so around, we're around the year 55 or so. Uh, that mm -hmm. he's and that he has gone on a journey already to, um, to, to, to establish this church and others. And he's keeping tabs on them and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, remaining in touch with them. Specifically in this case, and we won't get into it this week. We, we've nudged edge toward it but really okay. chapter five and six is where we really get into the problems that he's addressing okay um, and you, you uh you raise a good point because i i think what i i would like to do to uh begin is to, is to remind ourselves about where we are and that is um looking at some of the churches paul founded I, toward, toward the bottom right we have jerusalem where it all started paul was on the ride to damascus so up to syria we know paul is from tarsus right his name Paul, mm -hmm. and so that's where that is and uh and so these are the places that he went off to found these churches um italy is still italy. italy greece is still greece asia minor is now turkey um so uh crete is still crete cyprus is still cyprus you can still go to most of these places um and not be like where the heck am i so uh so this is what we talk about when we talk about where this is happening so corinth then uh, as we take a closer look at Corinth, Corinth is that isthmus between um, uh, the, uh, it, that four, mile, four and a half mile stretch between these two seas that allows people instead of going around, which is 200 miles, to go four miles across and to get to where they're going if they're trading between Italy and Asia or Cyprus or any of these places, um, or Greece especially that they're able to get back and forth. So to remind ourselves of, of what we're, we're um, looking at here, we are in chapter four, and I have um, that uh, reading queued up as well. So let's go to that. Uh, okay, there we go. So we begin, um, <clears throat> just in, the, in terms of recapping just a little bit, we, um, uh, we have followed Paul along through the beginning of this letter in which he talked about uh, what, uh, you know, the origins, he's writing it with Sosthenes, uh, mm. writing it to uh, a church that he started, he's writing it as a pastor, um, and he's, he's, he's been pretty commendatory towards them in many ways, but he's also calling them on the carpet. So, Kathy, would you read verses 1 through 5 for us as we start in 1 Corinthians 4? Stop moving it. Think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of the steward that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you at any human court. I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation from God. Okay. So uh, as we begin uh, in, in verse 4, uh, let's see, I'm also going to ask us to read this in another translation, Okay. And so here is the message here. And uh, Kathy will put you on uh, again to read uh, the message here. Do not imagine us leaders to be something we aren't. We are servants of Christ, not his master. We are guides into God's most sublime secrets. Hold on a minute. I got to shrink this so I can read it. Not security. Guards posted to protect them. The requirements for a good guy are reliability and accurate knowledge. It matters very little to me what you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion. I don't even rank myself. Comparison in these matters are pointless. 
I'm not aware of anything that would disqualify me from being a good guide for you, but that doesn't mean much. The master makes that judgment. Mm -hmm. And then verse five says, don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. When he comes, he will bring out in the open and place in evidence all kinds of things we never even dreamed of, inner motives and purposes and prayers. Only then will any one of us get to hear the well done of God. Okay. okay. We're jumping over to the NRSV here. Um, and what Paul gets into is, is really what your posture and my posture are to be, and that is his servants, okay? Um, think of us in this way as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Um, this, this whole idea that God is in charge and, and we're not seems to always elude us. <laughs> that in, in fact, we are servants of Christ and we are to take on uh, um, a posture of being a servant. Now, um, I, I think we lose that. I mean, I know I, when I look at my life and I was pondering this this morning as I was preparing that, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're made for community. We're made to be with each other. We want to be liked. And uh, part of my desire to be liked is to be a person of accomplishment or to be a person who, you know, has, 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 has you know, made some kind of mark, if you will. Um, and, and Paul is, is really trying to remind us that, you know, we, we, that God makes the mark and that we're the ones who are to be servants of the Almighty and anything that we get is a pure gift from God. Any, uh, any, any uh, promotion, any kind of... Uh, uh, remuneration is not of our own doing. It is a gift of God. So think of it this way, as servants in Christ and stewards of God's mystery. Those are two different words. Stewards uh, in the uh, servants, for example, servants, which he mentions first. I want to pull up an illustration for you. Um, this is uh, what is called a, uh, a, um, a triremi, okay? And this was a very common boat back in the time of, uh, of Paul's journeys. And what you have in here are a mess of different people rowing. Now, the Greek word uh, for, uh, for servant here is, was basically taken from the word rower, uh, which is pictured here, uh, which is what these guys do. Uh, none of these guys who are rowing are in charge. <laughs> um, they are all, uh, the, 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 uh, all serving uh, in the same capacity. This is what the word servant means, and Paul uses it in the Greek. Is it, it, it is to be equated with somebody who is one of the many rowers of the boat. And so the early, uh, the early uh, recipients of this letter would have said, oh, okay, this is the Greek word he's using. This is the image I get in my mind, that we're not the head of the boat, but that Christ is the head of the boat. And so you have the one word that, that translates servants, you've got the other as stewards. Now, stewards, uh, you, maybe you've, you've heard that term, uh, uh, and, and I, you often hear it domestically, like, um, oh, you know, there's my wife. She's the major domo, okay? That means she's the chief steward. She is the one who's in charge of the house. Um, and, and the major domo used in this context means that whoever the major domo is means they're the major servant, okay, the major steward, so that the, the woman, in fact, would not be in charge. It's the man's house and the man's in charge. Uh, and, and so this idea of being in charge of one's household, and if it wasn't the woman of the house, then it was the chief servant. So um, I just use that because of the patri patriarchal nature of this, uh, of this text. Uh, but if you, can if you can imagine in your mind that Paul is talking about one of the many rowers of the boat, uh, the chief steward of, of, the, uh, of the household, but neither of those are the owner or the boss or the, 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 where the buck stops of that, uh, of that household. And so these are images Paul's trying to use to get these ideas across, that you are a servant of Christ, meaning you are rowing when Christ says row. You are picking up the oar when Christ says pick it up. You are showing up on time and your, your, um, your, your, your whole uh, job depends on, uh, on, 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 that, uh, on, on Christ who is the head. And, and then, of course, a steward of God's mystery. What do you guys think of when you, when you think of that word steward, or even like stewardship? Our contribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I sort of think of it. Mm -hmm. I think about <laughs> being responsible with those things that you 
that you're supposed to be taking care of. You know, like if you're the wine steward, you, you, you know, you, you watch over the wine, you make sure it stays cold, you serve it, you know, when it's prepared correctly, yeah. you know, you're in charge of the fermentation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's a good analogy is the, the wine steward and what they're up to. Pat Tilly, what comes to mind to you when you hear the, these words, servants and stewards? Uh, before I can be a good, good servant or a steward, I have to know Jesus or the master personally. And oh. by knowing him personally, he can direct my path into how he wants me to be a steward for him. That's how I see it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you either have to know them or know of them. Um, to, enough to know that you ain't the boss. Mm -hmm. Well, right. even knowing of them doesn't bring the full weight of how he wants me to be the person for, for him. For, and that's just me talking about where I am. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, so what about you, Kitty? What comes to mind when you hear the words uh, steward and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, servant? I guess I just think of, um, it's like taking care of the gifts that you have. Like, don't make anything worse. Um, just taking good care of it so it's there for other people so they can see things. Even like steward of, you know, the earth around us. We just had Earth Day. What does it mean to be a good steward of the gift of the earth that God has given us? you know, to share that, but not make it any, not make it any worse. Yeah. Also, so it's there for other people, like sort of making the gift even better by taking care of it. Yeah. Or a good steward of your body, you know, putting the right food into your body, you know, the choices, um, all kinds of things. Sure, sure. Uh, what comes to mind for you, Jane Roberts? Exactly what Kim said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. So, but in neither of these cases do we understand ourselves as the boss. Um, and, and, and Paul seemed to be very adamant that we are servants of Christ, stewards of God's mysteries. Yeah, the, the caretaker. Uh, the caretaker. What do we suppose is meant by God's mysteries here? Uh, what, are, what, are, what, are, what will be God's mysteries? <clears throat> and let me back up by saying that this terminology is very... Um, it's very intentional. Um, at this time, uh, something that we term in, in our modern day uh, as the mystery religions were, were rampant back then. Um, Gnosticism, uh, Donatism, a lot of these religions that held that if you had the key, then God would be made real to you. Um, that there was some sort of earning that had to go on. Uh, but Paul's going to say here is that God's mysteries are given to us by grace. They're unlocked, they're free to everybody. It's not a hidden thing that you have to give so much money to, to church or go through so many spiritual aerobics to arrive at. Um, this is something that you simply get. This Sunday, um, we're gonna, well, one of the Sundays coming up, we're gonna hear um, uh, in John's gospel, the great high priestly prayer, in which we hear in John chapter 17, verse three, that here, now I give to you eternal life, and eternal life is this. And Paul will say, excuse me, and John will say that eternal life is knowing God. And, uh, and, and so it's, it's free. There you go. You got it. You know what it is. You don't have to go through all kinds of gymnastics. Um, and these mystery religions would say that, well, you know, you, you arrive, think of, uh, uh, think of uh, Scientology, if you will, that you have different um, levels that you ascend to and you have to pay more money or take so many classes or something to, to get to the top. Paul is like, well, God's mysteries uh, are actually free. It's grace. But this is who he's talking to, is a, a very secular Gentile crowd who would have understand, oh, the mysteries, what are the God's mysteries? I, I'm, for some reason, there was quite a, a, a keen interest on, on unlocking the mysteries and that you were to do that by works and not by faith. Uh, if we look at this rendering of this first line in the message, it says, don't imagine us leaders as something we aren't. We are servants of Christ, not as masters. We are guides into his most sublime, what sublime supreme secrets, not security guards posted to protect them, okay? So we're guides into God's sublime secrets, not security guards posted to protect them. That's a nice, uh, a, a, a nice turn of phrase, isn't it? And that's what we are. 
we're guides into God's uh, most m- most supreme secrets, and we're not security guys supposed to protect them. I don't know about you, but I I um, um, I uh, I hate it when I see. I mean, even our sign on the garden that says uh, that says um, "Don't sit on this wall." Uh, I, I I just want to go out there and say, "You're welcome to sit anywhere you like." However, this wall is really fragile, and if you sit on it, you might fall off. So that's why we <laughs> find one of these comfortable seats nearby. Uh, even when we came up with the signage to our front doors at church, uh, instead of saying, you know, something like don't enter this door, it's always locked. Uh, it started out by saying, thank you so much for stopping by our main entrance is in back. So, so the way that these things are phrased, I think really, um, and, and I, I, as I go out in public and see some signs, like, you know, you see them in bathrooms and this kind of thing, you're like, can't you turn the phrase a little bit and be more inviting about it? And, and, and I, I kind of, I, I, I'm, I, I'm drawn towards this kind of uh, invitation. I think that's more uh, that's who God is, is God invites us. And that uh, translation talks about, uh, we're not security guards posted to protect it. Uh, we're guides into God's most sublime secrets. And so then on the, in, the, um, in the second verse here, <clears throat> uh, pa- Paul says, moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Oh, okay. Uh, you, you'd think that we would get that. <laughs> that, that we're actually, this is part of the job description, is we were supposed to be able to trust what we say. Uh, and Paul says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any other human court. I don't even judge myself. Um, this, is a, um, this is an allusion to, uh, I, I want to read to you what I um, popped out of here. Um, and, and this is the idea that, um, the Corinthians with their sects and their appropriation of the leaders of the church as their masters have exercised judgments on these leaders, referring one to the other. Paul speaks to various judgments that they're referring to. Um, let's see. Or something else here um and and that is okay yeah here it is um when roman general won a great victory he was allowed to parade through town with his victorious army uh in a big procession and uh, you you go through the streets of the city with all the trophies that they won and this was called a triumph you know in france they have the l'arc de triomphe they have a, a big triumphal arch and this is what armies did as they marched through them and said we won we won we won part of that procession at the end uh, was a group of captives who were doomed to to die they were to go into the coliseum and they were to fight these and to die so um the the illusion here it, when when paul says um uh, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. I do not even judge myself. Uh, it's, it's this idea that Paul uh, doesn't count himself as one of the triumphal ones who go through town. He counts himself as one of the slaves in back who are destined to death. Um, we talk about these words, death to Christ, death to flesh, death to self, that Paul gives us, you know, that Paul gives to us. The idea being how are we as servants to put to death the things we want so that we can bring to life the things our master wants, right? And we think of that in our own lives. What are the things that I need to lessen myself about so that Christ in me may be increased, so that the works of Christ could be done? Um, verse four, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but, I'm, uh, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each one will receive commendation from God. To pick that up in uh, in, uh, the, the other translation, the requirements for a good guide are reliability and accurate knowledge. It matters very little to me what you think of me, even less where I rank in popular opinion. I don't even rank myself. Comparisons in these matters are pointless. I'm not aware of anything that would disqualify me from being a good guide for you, but that doesn't mean much. The master makes the judgment. So don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. When he comes, 
he will bring out in the open and place in evidence all kinds of things we never dreamed of, inner motives, purposes and, pr purposes and prayers. Only then will any of us get to hear the well done of God. Uh, there's a popular t-shirt out, even a bumper sticker that says, don't judge me, right? Um, and, and the idea being that uh, you don't know my heart. And Paul seems to be something very saying something very similar, is the motives of my heart are known to God and will be known later on. Um, Paul uh, is obviously talking to uh, a church that's not understanding that uh, we're supposed to be servants and stewards, right? Um, they're not getting the, um, the idea that to be knitted together with Christ means that we have to put other people first. Because as we know, you know, you all are the only ones, it's the only God I can see is God in you. And so I'm called to serve you. My greatness depends on my humility. Um, it, it, my, uh, my desire to serve God is manifest in my desire to serve you. Um, my desire to put God first is, my, is manifested in my desire to put you first. What are your thoughts? What's going on in your life? How can you be helped? And then putting my own, um, my own desires aside. Now, this gets to be very tricky because, as we know, uh, you know, God put desires in our hearts. God has given gifts for you and me to use. Um, uh, the, uh, what is that cartoon character, John Dormat? You know, I mean, are we just supposed to be people that just get walked over? Uh, not at all. There is a keen balance. And that's why I think you and I keep coming to Bible studies and keep coming to, um, uh, to, to you know, uh, to, to, to places of knowledge so that we might learn how to draw that line. How do I be a servant and a steward, yet at the same time exercise my gifts and, and my opinion and express my opinion? I mean, these well, are really important things. Right. Which I uh, yeah, uh, who's talking? <laughs> Go ahead, Jane. Thanks. The secret is, um, you know, um, seek the Lord first, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So as long as you put him first, um, your desires won't be wrong. I mean, you can follow your desires because he's guiding, he's leading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As long as you're following God, there's no contradiction because what? you're under his will. And you're still, you know, he's given you the desires of your heart. So right. you're free to follow them. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but how to follow is always a difficult part, isn't it? Um, and you were going to say something. Yeah, just listen to the Holy Spirit within you. My sheep know my voice, another they will not follow. Yeah. So if, yeah. if you're good at listening. Well, yeah. And then what happens when, when you hear different things? Um, mm. You know, it, what, Another, they will not follow. If you're his sheep, you're going to listen to his voice. If you're his lamb, mm -hmm. his voice will be louder. Okay, Janet, you're going to say something. That's where the discernment comes in. Okay. That's exactly right. Janet, you were going to say something? No, I was saying, when I said the word contribute, I think I meant it in a way that I have received this beautiful gift of love from God. How do I go out into the world and show it to everyone else? What are my actions? How am I being a good servant, good steward? And I guess that's how I look upon it and try to, it's hard every day to do that. Yeah. It's a real work. But how, how do we do it without, go ahead. I have received this gift. Mm -hmm. Now I need to, I say contribute, but really share it and take it out into the world. And how do we do that with, how do we do that with pure motives? Uh, because, you know, that's always a big part of it is how, um, you know, how, how do we really um, show the motives of our hearts, which we hope would be pure. Um, you know, I, I think of uh, you know, a friend once gave a gift to the family and uh, the person who received the gift uh, didn't, did something with it that the giver didn't like. And it was like, well, you know, you don't get to say, you know, you gave the gift and you're done. But but when we always take the gift of ourselves, bring it out into the world. Um, how do, do we really divorce ownership from it? You know, how pure are our motives? Do we want to be, do we want our name on the side of the hospital? You know, mm -hmm. you know to what degree? Yeah. Degree? Yeah. yeah. I find that a big question. But Jane, you brought up an interesting point on discernment. 
because we see that there are all kinds, you know, hundreds, millions of people who have greatly discerned that Donald Trump is the savior of our entire American enterprise. And they are at church and they're, you know, celebrating and lifting up the name of Jesus and they're convinced that Donald Trump is, is the man. And then you go into other congregations that feel, uh, for some reason, the opposite and, and that, that the, the, the Antichrist has shown up. <coughs> here he is with orange hair. There's a, there's a whole philosophy about that, that those evangelicals who uh, belong to the cult of Trump um, are really um, the result of a long line of uh, patriarchal nationalistic. <coughs> like, it's like a cult, it, it's aligned with notions of white supremacy, uh, patriarchy, um, things that, I don't know, might have been at one point derived from the Old Testament, but are really not uh, don't line up with the teachings of Jesus. Well, you know, and I will say... Other, no, they're putting political motives in front of the teachings of Jesus, and they don't know it. Well, it, it. The, They are not exercising God-given discernment. Well, but, you know, it, their arguments would obviously be very different. And, you know, and that's them, for Christ's sake. I mean, <laughs> right, right, right. They, they drunk the Kool-Aid. They're right. members of a cult. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, all you have to do is read Matthew 5 and 6 compared to what they say, and you know that they're, um, well, cray-cray. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I'm glad you have an opinion. Um, the, uh, what, what, what we want to do is, is in subjecting all things to Christ and coming up with discernment, which is that great word that you mentioned, um, is, is we, we, want to, uh, we want to clothe our discernment in humility. We want to clothe our discernment in love. We want to close our discernment in honesty and pure motive um, and, and, and realize that God made us differently and we are going to have different opinions for different yeah. reasons. And um, that's well and good I, as long as you leave your humility at the door when you go to the voting booth. Well, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, you and I see it that, that Jesus prayed uh, in, 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 you know, you know, very, very uh, deeply and hard that we would all be one. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I don't interpret that as all voting for the same person, because I think God made us very different people with very different ideas, with very different proclivities, because in the culmination of the breadth and richness of humanity, we can more fully see the beauty and wonder of God. Okay. What I think when, when Jesus says you should all be one is that we are of one accord in loving and respecting one another for the differences that we have. Remember, we're not to be the judge. God is to be the judge. We're not to be the condemners. God is to be the condemners. Uh, we're to be the people who are rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus. And uh, there's no room for anything else. Paul is, this is what I love about this letter. We're going to get up to chapter 13 one of these days, and all of our minds are going to be blown because we're going to read those iconic words in a bunch of different translations that remind us that love is the key. Tell that to Franklin Graham. Well, I, I, I don't have to. I mean, my job isn't to bring around You're Franklin right. Graham. Okay. My job is to love Franklin Graham. And my right. job, you know, so the psychologists, our, all of our experience will show us you can't change anyone. All you can do is change yourself. And in changing yourself, you change the vibes around you in, in ways that others are going to notice and perhaps affect <laughs> on them. But I can't let my happiness rise or fall on what Franklin Graham does. Uh, my happiness rises and continues to rise the more I root it in Jesus. Um, and so, so this idea of discernment um, has to be very personal. Um, I can, certainly as a priest preach discernment. Here's how you do it. Here's how we can do it. But I, I can't go into, you know, Pat Tilly's mind and say, oh, that's wrong. You did this right. You know, should do it this way. Um, what I can do is practice, model, teach, and preach, which is what Jesus sent the apostles out to do. You, you go practice, just, you model it, you teach it, and you preach it. You um, Father Chris, very... may, I, may I speak? Yes, Pat, go ahead. Um, one of the things I'm hearing you say, and maybe I'm not hearing correctly, is that Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the other thing is, he's always saying, remember, you will have enemies. I am paraphrasing. But do good to them. Pray for them. Let them be first in your prayers in order to be able to understand the differences. 
because not each one of us has, it, it, we can be twins and still be so different. Um, I may not agree with someone, but I have had great opportunities to be in groups where we don't agree, but we have a discussion and we don't get hyper. But the thing is, it, for me, it's being able to see somebody like Christ sees them, whether they have the same opinion that I do. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do that all the time, but every once in a while, the me comes out and I see somebody <laughs> entirely different. But I, I, I try to remind myself, he said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Pray continually. Do not stop praying. And if you think you have an enemy, do good for him. How can we do good? For me, it's praying the best for that person that I don't agree with. Now, that's just me talking, not anybody else. Uh, but the thing that's hard right now is I, I agree with what you're saying, and I, I would always hope I could be that way. But when you have, and I don't want it to become a political issue, but what frightens me is when you have your president saying, you know, maybe you can use Lysol, maybe you can do a disinfectant, and there are people who are scared, and they take that to heart, and think that maybe that is a cure, and they should do it. Then I get very worried about that kind of um, experience. With well, isn't that when we ask them to think uh, in a way that is, is that a practical solution? But not Rather everybody than, does yeah, that way. It, that's the and, issue. Yeah, and I can, I can tell you, we in our family know some people who even thought of drinking that like they said to do. And I asked, huh, I, well, actually Brian did. Um, and how is your throat going to feel after that? <laughs> you know, yeah. but this is when we're being, you know, it's coming up. We're not perfect. None of us. I wish I could say I am. I wish I didn't disagree with some things but oh boy um first i know where yes i first know who i'm walking with and who's walking with me and he keeps pinching me don't think like that don't do that don't <laughs> yeah you know. and those pinches can be really really difficult to handle yeah uh father y'all you said something a while back that was very interesting to me. I wish you'd expand on it. You, you talked about uh, telling us how to discern. Yeah. And I've always wondered about that. I mean, there's, uh, what, do you have a method for that? I, well, I do. I mean, I, 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 what, one of the things that attracted me, as you guys know, I was raised Catholic, but what, what attracted me to the Episcopal Church was this discernment model uh, mm -hmm. that was rooted first in scripture, yeah. uh, second in, in tradition, and, right. uh, and third in, in uh, reason. Well, yeah. any specific scripture passages? Well, yeah. I mean, I think that comes through uh, in light of the breadth of the whole Bible. Uh, when we first talk about scripture and that being our main rock, um, you know, we, we have 1 Timothy 3, talking uh, 3.10, saying uh, every word of scripture is God-breathed, right? Mm -hmm. that, that there is this sense that, um, you know, there is truth in the scriptures. And this idea that, um, uh, that it, the church has done the best they can to follow the scripture and to build upon that rock, quote unquote, and using one of Jesus's metaphor. Um, and so then we get to, okay, well, scripture is going to be your guide. Every Christian says scripture is your guide. Then what's your unique way of, of interpreting that scripture? And interpreting that scripture in light of past history, what is try, you know, what, what's it saying? And, and also in light of, of, of reason. Okay. And so when we read scripture, uh, one of the first things we do is we read it together when we study scripture. Um, I want to hear what Jane has to say. I want to hear what Jan has to say, what Kitty has to say. And, and, and we use the group to discern what does this really mean? Uh, we also put scripture against scripture and say, well, this says this, Therefore, I mean, you know, we have a lot of people who will take a, 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 a verse and say, well, you know, it clearly says that uh, Jesus is against divorce because of this, uh, what this text said. 
and and so uh, we will then, um, you know, it, 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 and then lo and behold, 2,000 years later, the church is no longer against divorce in the same way. Why? Well, we started reading that scripture in light of other scriptures. Yeah, and Paul, where he says, God wants you to live in peace. Well, I mean, you know, it, these are all difficult subjects, and many of them hot mm-hmm. Uh, because you will find Christians of very good conscience and motive coming down on different sides of hot button issues, which is why I think the key to our unity is love and not uh, absolute, you know, uniformity on everything that that you know that every Christian would absolutely have to um, uh, come uh, come in contact with. So, so the idea is that we read is we read the scriptures. Um, uh, we read the scriptures with. Uh, uh, with open minds to how, and, and what I mean by that is we're also not afraid to get educated about the scripture. Not only am I going to read it in community, but I'm going to also uh, consult uh, books and book of commentaries that talk about what this book is about, okay? So that I've got um, other, the thinking and reasoning of other people coming to light um, as well. And so this becomes really important that uh, we don't read scripture cavalierly, but we read it with informed common sense. And I like that phrase, informed common sense, that we don't uh, act like we're the very first people who ever opened the Bible. Um, now there's, a, there, you know, when I was, shall we say, young in the Lord or less mature in my faith, and it was the first time I opened the Bible, wow, there was some amazing stuff there. But uh, what I'm more interested in is, is, is having a reasonable look at what this text tells us. So therefore, I'm going to be very conscious of the fact that it was written this long ago. It, was, it, it came into being under this kind of cultural ethos. Um, you know, these are the linguistic uh, aspects to take, uh, take into account. These are the sociological things that, that have ramifications on this text. These are the archaeological findings that we have that point to the text. So informed common sense uh, comes into our understanding of how scripture is to be read. Um, and that's shared by a lot of Christians. I mean, I'd, I'd say probably most of them. Um, but really our problem, and Paul gets into this, which is why we keep uh, reading these letters and, and this Bible, is, is it's not, you know, having a Bible is not the problem. Reading it is the problem, you know? I mean, you know, it, it's, it's not having this wisdom. I mean, I'm looking at a stack of books behind me. Y'all have seen the ones in my office and even in my living room, stacks and stacks. It's, it's getting that knowledge in us and acting from it. And so, so what Paul's giving, giving here and throughout this letter, especially when he gets to, to 13, is this idea that we are servants and stewards, we are to be humble, and we are to look for the, the, uh, the instructions from on high, not make them up ourselves, not figure that we're the sum total of all knowledge, but to realize where we are in the continuum. So our discernment comes out of reading scripture with informed common sense, uh, that means knowing the way Christians before us have interpreted it. Um, that's what the tradition aspect of is. Well, the church is, and that's why it's taken, it took so doggone long for us to talk about, well, you know, there shouldn't be slavery. Because in the Bible, it, it, Paul never, you know, Paul condones slavery. He doesn't say, go free your slaves. And so we had a long time figuring out, you know what? That's actually not cool. Uh, which took us a long time to, to, to give women the role they have to, it's not perfect now, but it took a really long time for us to say, wait a minute, you know, the woman, because, you know, she got Adam's rib and, you know, she's supposed to be the help maiden, you know, the help meet or whatever the King James calls it. it. took us a really long time to look at that scripture, to revise our tradition and say, you know what, blacks should vote. You know, I mean, this was all scripturally backed, you know, p- political uh, uh, you know, uh, stands that the church took because this is how we read the Bible. And so when people say, well, no, that's, that's the Bible, that's how it's written, nothing can ever change in our interpretation. Well, that's a really hubristic way of somebody in power looking at the scripture. If you have to be a woman or a black or somebody in, in, in a marginalized place, that's, that's, that's not really liberating. That's not the good news, right? Um, but it, it takes us, it's, it, it's not easy. That discernment is not easy. And I, I remember when I was newly ordained priest is when we first decided to, out in the open, say we're going to ordain a gay man, as if the church had never ordained a gay man in their life, right? I mean, we've been doing it for, 
probably 2,000 years. But then finally, we were going to ordain somebody who said they were gay, right? Everybody else had to say, no, I'm not. And so, um, so when we did that, I was just a very young priest at the time. I remember it well. Um, there was a great amount of discussion in how did we come up with this when Scripture says. And we had to go back and say, well, how did we come out to, you know, ordain a woman? How did we go out to accept a black man into our church as an equal? Um, how did we go back to uh, to accept slaves into our midst when you know again Paul uh, Paul clearly condoned it? Um, and so these are difficult, and and that's why I say the church is has it, we're not where we're supposed to be, but we're hopefully closer to where we we need to be, um, and that is places of liberation, places of freedom. And that discernment of that scripture, I don't mean to say that here are three steps and you've got it right, because it's not that easy. Um, the best way is to do, as Paul is, is, is um, edging on in our reading today, is to do it humbly and as servants and stewards. This is scripture that's been given to us. We are to be stewards of that Bible. Uh, th this is text that's holy writ that's been giving us, given to us. We're to be, approach it as servants and not like, oh, well, here's what it says. No, we're, we're never going to be able to walk in love if I can't hear an alternative view, alter, if I can't honestly hear an alternative view of it. Um, and so I think that the Holy Spirit is calling each one of us to be more humble because as we live out um, the great high priestly prayer, which Jesus said, I pray you all would be one, I pray you would all be one in love is what he means, in loving and respecting one another and not, you know, showing up at the table with our, you know, our, our interlocutor. And then when the meeting's over, turning around and telling our friends, now that person was actually like this, you know, it's not backbiting. It's not, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's being honest and, and being, and I think we all, you know, I was on a zoom call with a guy I really love. He lived, works in New York and he's works at a church and he's one of the most, one of the smartest, most humble people I know. And, and I do know that there, you know, there, there are people, you know, who are able to put the text into, uh, in, 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 into, uh, in practice and being as humble and as much of a steward and a servant as Paul is asking them to be here. Um, I think when we do that, um, I mean, nobody I've ever heard in my life has ever spoken a bad word about Kitty Kenning. I mean, she, yeah, right. <laughs> nice. right. you know, I mean, she is a true servant and true steward. And, and I think that in that, that becomes her strength, that, that this is, you know, and this is supposed to be all of our strengths is we are supposed to be known by servanthood and our steward, our, our stewardship. Um, so Jane, when I think about discernment, that's kind of where my mind goes. It goes to scripture, tradition, and reason. And we could go on and on about, proper discernment in, 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 and, and the, all the nuances and facets like doing that. But that's basically- I, like, I like what Pat said that sort of stuck with me, just to see people as Christ sees them. Mm. You know, oh. you use that as your bottom line. I thought that was, those were how good words. You know how Christ sees them. I mean, you know, like how do we know? Well, I, guess, I guess in love, he sees them as redeemable. Redeemable, that's good yeah yeah i mean you know i i think god's often to, you know if, kitty if god was going to come down and say kitty i got some advice to you it would probably be um try to see how loved you are try to see how what a great job you're doing you know because i, I think we're the ones that put our own pressure on ourselves and we're the ones thinking we're not worthy we're the ones thinking we're not doing enough we're the ones who are beating us up and god is saying actually you're doing great you know, you really are doing exactly what I want you to do. Um, and I, I think there's great, um, uh, I think there's great reward in that. Um, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of people need to hear that. That's why we need to build each other up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, amen, amen. So let me share, uh, let me, uh, let's see, let me share the screen here. Uh, for our next uh, pericope here. Um, Okay, and uh, let's see, who has not read yet? Um, let's see. Um, I wonder if you can read, uh, Jane, do you want to read uh, verses 6 and 7? I'll try to get through it. Um, I have applied all this to Apollos and myself for your benefit, 
brothers and sisters, so that you may learn through us the meaning of the saying, nothing beyond what is written, so that none of you will be puffed up in favor one against another. For um, one sees anything different in you. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead and read it uh, here. Six mm -hmm. through eight. All right now, friends. Um, is showing how these things pertain to Apollos and me so that you will learn restraint and not rush into making judgments without knowing all the facts. It's important to look at things from God's point of view. I would rather not see you inflating or deflating reputations based on mere hearsay. Yeah, Peterson really is a paraphrase. I mean, yep. he takes a lot of liberties, I think. Yep. I think sometimes he strays, in my opinion. But go on. Verses 7 and 8. For who do you know that really knows you, knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything they would discover in you that you could take credit for? Isn't everything you have and everything you are sheer gifts from God? So what's the point of all this comparing and competing? You already have what you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle. Without bringing either Apollos or me into it, you're sitting on top of the world, at least God's world, and we're right there sitting alongside you. <laughs> Equality. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, so verse 6 and 7. I have applied all this to Apollos and myself for your benefit. And what is it that he's, he's applied? Um, and, and this is the idea that... Um, uh, they're, they're not uh, they're not pronouncing judgment they are servants as well um, for your benefit brothers and sisters so that you may learn through us the meaning of the saying and this is the saying nothing beyond what is written so that none of you will be puffed up in favor of one against another for who sees anything different in you what do you have that you did not receive and if you received it why do you boast as if it were not a gift again paul is talking about things you and i do all the time um, if everything we has is a gift, why do we boast about anything? <laughs> you know, um, whether it would be something we own, an attribute we have, a family relationship. I mean, um, I think of all the boasting that I always do. And why do you boast? It's because you have a poor self-image, right? I, I shouldn't say a poor self-image, but, uh, you know, we, we yeah, need to get that's our exactly right. Yeah, we need to get our affirmations from things and people instead of from God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think some people really are wired not to put the spotlight on themselves um, as much as others are. Uh, but there, there, there gets to be this great need among some people. This is again, how they're wired uh, for them to behave in such a way. And um, uh, you know, so, so Paul, but of course there are, um, you know, there are, there are ways that we can tamp these things down. And the idea is that, um, you know, in what ways do we boast about things without realizing that they were all just a gift? <laughs> you know, um, all these things that we have that we want to quote unquote take pride in, uh, and 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 so what's going on in the church here is 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 uh, the church is making this the age old mistake of putting the created thing above the creator. Things that we still, I mean, it's called idolatry. Isn't that the, the, the sum of the, the first couple of commandments? Thou shalt have no other God but me. Thou shalt not have any false idols. We continue to battle that. And that is putting anything we have, including our reputations, our looks, our jobs, our, you know, you name it, anything before God. Um, and, and in some ways, uh, we put our ideas of God before God. So I will stand up for... Um, uh, you know, I'll stand up for the way I see God as, as God. Um, I know that gets to be a little bit difficult to understand, but um, this, this, this means that we become idolaters when we are too uh, convinced and focused that our idea of God is, is more important than God, right? Um, mm. That's can, why we have denominations. Well, it's some people who get so so caught up in pride over their denomination. You know, it, 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 uh, long after the world, long after the world is gone, you know, long after God is dead, the Episcopal Church will still be standing. You know that 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 uh, 
you know, we are, um, we are to make sure that even our ideas of who God is, our pictures of God don't supersede God. And that calls for a great amount of humility. You know, that calls for you and me to really respect, hey, you know what? Um, I, I can, I, I absolutely hate it when I'm flipping around the channels and somebody stops and it's the, the, the televangelist I hate and he says something that makes sense. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Something that touches you, right? And you're I like, I had hey, a very good that. exegesis by uh, Jeffers. They, uh, he was talking about a passage that I had just been thinking about. Um, I forget which one it was. And I, and I turned it on, you know, I was flipping the channels and I got the life outreach showers. And there was Jeffers giving this excellent exposition of, of this, this very passage. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Yeah. 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 Well, Susan, let me ask you to go ahead with verse eight here and read through 13. You've got to unmute yourself, Susan. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Quite apart from us, you have become kings. Indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as those sentenced to, de to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. We are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in dis disrepute. To the present hour, we are hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we grow weary from the work of our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we speak kindly. We have become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. Okay, go ahead and read through, uh, through 13 here. Oops, can you raise it up a little? Uh, I think that's- I'm gonna miss the bottom end. lines. It's on your end. Okay. It seems to me that God has put us, has, put us who oh, bear pardon. his message on a stage in a theater in which no one wants. Oh, hold on a sec. Are you reading for who do you know? That no. Really Oops. Wrong. Okay. I, I skipped it. Okay. For who do you know that really knows you, knows your heart? And even if they did, is there anything they would discover in you that you could take credit for? Everything you have and everything you are, sheer gifts from God. So what's the point of comparing and competing? You already have all you need. You already have more access to God than you can handle without bringing either Apollos or me into it. You're sitting on top of the world, at least God's world, and we're right here sitting along beside you. It seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in which no one wants to buy a ticket. We're something, we're something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the streets. We're the Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time, we don't have enough to eat. We wear patched and threadbare clothes. We get doors slammed in our faces, and we pick up odd jobs anywhere we can to eke out a living. When they call us names, we say, God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we put in a good word for them. We're treated like garbage, potato peelings from the culture's kitchen, and it's not getting any better. How about that, huh? Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So what is Paul trying to say here? Paul is trying to is describe for us uh, what being a disciple is like mm-hmm. and what they expect and therefore what we should expect. We're the Messiah's misfits, right? <laughs> you might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, one of the difficulties you and I get into is, is when we uh, are in a, um, we're in a <coughs> Christian country. When we're in a place where, gosh, you know, um, uh, Jesus is the head of, uh, you know, most people here are Christians. And what does it mean then for us to live in this culture where predominantly we have Jesus people around us? Um, Paul didn't have that. I mean, Paul had a culture that was very antagonistic and um, really, you know, against what he was doing. And so what happens when you and I live in a, in a quote-unquote Christian culture where doing Christian things is actually practiced widely. I mean, we have hospitals and people like Kathy Graham who devote their life to taking care of people. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what um, Christians are supposed to do. This was not the culture he was talking about. So um, the verse 8, already you, you have all in all, already you become rich. Quite apart from us, you become kings. Indeed, I wish you'd become kings so that we might be kings with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as though sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. Again, he's drawing on that analogy of the triumphant king and his... Uh, uh, soldiers coming in and having the uh, pre-sentenced slaves in the background, right? Because they have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to mortals. Um, and so Paul says quite willingly in verse 10, we are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we're hungry and thirsty. We're poorly clothed. We're beaten. We're homeless. And we grow weary from the work of our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we speak kindly. We become like the rubbish of the world, the dregs of all things to this very day. It uh, doesn't sound like you'd want to convert to this religion, does it? No. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what he's <clears throat> trying to get at is this is what the world thinks of us. Um, you know, to pursue worldly approval to pursue popularity in the world, um, in Paul's mind, is, is absolutely crazy. Because in verse 10, we are fools for the sake of Christ, meaning that uh, we are putting others first. We are intentionally humble and wanting to really look out for the good of others. And that means that if we're giving all our goods away so that others can eat or others can have something to eat or drink, um, uh, you know, th- these are these are the realities that I think you and me are called to to ponder as we look at walking more deeply with Jesus. Um, you know, are we willing to to be as uh, countercultural as Jesus is? Excuse me, as Paul is suggesting here. Um, are we willing to be fools for the sake of Christ? And what does that look like? Um, can you be a disciple of Jesus and quote unquote? have it all. Uh, this is one of those difficult passages where Paul is really suggesting that, look, you know, g- give of yourselves in, in some really important ways. The same time, as, as Jane was pointing out, it's something that demands discernment. Because if everybody's homeless, how are you going to take care of the kids? You know, if everybody's poorly clothed, you know, how are you going to get into the restaurant, right? No shirt, no, no shoes, no service, right? Um, becoming like the rubbish of the world. Um, we certainly, I mean, I, all of us take, take this passage metaphorically. I don't see any of us who are, you know, literally hungry and thirsty and walking around beaten and homeless, poorly clothed, okay? Um, we're not taking this, you know, literally. Should we? People throughout the ages have, and they've been commended for it. I mean, there's no question that the most beloved saint in all of Christendom is somebody who did just this, and that, that was, of course, St. Francis. Um, St. Francis took this literally, uh, and, and the world has now put uh, images of him in their gardens. You know, boy, don't mess with my computer, okay? Um, <laughs> yeah. 
in here. Uh, but but we're, I think, really asked to, and I don't think there's an easy way around this. I mean, I don't think we can write this off and say, well, times have changed. I can have my six Mercedes Benzes, right? Um, I, I think that we have to really struggle with this and say, well, in what ways are we, um, are, are, are we sharing the struggle? And, you know, do we share it, it, it um, you know, in, in um, uh, uh, do we, you know, be, I even think of the monks who have nothing, and even in monasteries, they argue over pride and, you know, and 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 and, and some of these other things. It's it's not, uh, it's not always the thing that has you. It's it's the it's it, it's it's the idea of the thing or the desire for the thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, this is this is not easy to. Uh, to, to kind of rationalize and and find an easy box for these are difficult words. I think they were meant to be then, and I think they are today. Um, in in what ways are we um, beaten and homeless and thirsty and hungry? And I think that asks in what ways are we uh, are, are we taking on the sufferings of the world? At mass this morning, when we commemorated the life of uh, Christina Rossetti, um, talked a little bit about. Um, her life as being somebody who was racked with mental illness. Um, and, and through her suffering came the great words to the song, you know, in the bleak midwinter um, and, and other poems and child stories that out of our suffering, you know, some of these things can, can creative things can happen. Um, certainly out of Paul's suffering, some great things happen. But how are we, if not to, to, uh, to literally emulate this and literally walking out of our homes <laughs> Uh, going down to the homeless shelter, I guess, right? Uh, but turning into this kind of folk, um, you know, there's a lot of discernment, Jane, to use your word, that, that goes on when we get to this passage. Um, any other thoughts on this? It's not an easy one, is it? No. no. Why, is, why is he calling uh, his students, so to speak, or his congregation, uh, why is he using this language to say that they're wise in Christ, for instance? Why is he uh, mm -hmm. saying that? I, I assume he's talking about the, the apostles as contract, uh, contrasted to the congregation. Well, it seems that he's going on with this uh, uh, dichotomy when he gets to uh, we're weak, but you're strong. Uh, you're held in honor, but we're disrebuted. Um, you know, that he's, he's going on to say that to be deeply rooted and grounded in Christ uh, means that the world does not, uh, means that you have worldly wisdom, we have spiritual wisdom, right? Um, he says uh, you are wise in Christ. You, well, uh, you know, all I can, I mean, I'm drawing from the phrases afterward. Okay. You know, that, that uh, they're fools for the sake of Christ, but they're, you know, they're the opposite. Seems to where he's, be where he's going because of the context that it's in. Um, huh. You know, who's holding them in honor? Well, that would be the world, right? Oh, okay. We're holding you in honor, but we, of course, well, it, are reputed by those who are uh, bestowing such a. That a seems to be in contradiction to them being wise in Christ. It's yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a great derivation. I don't know if that's a great translation of of, of that, um, huh. because I it, it seems from the context that what is what does he say here? Um, <coughs> It seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater where something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the street where the Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailty and uncertainty. You might be well thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Uh -huh. You know, so he seems to be going back and forth. And, and that it seems that that phrase, wise in Christ, is, isn't quite literally what he's getting at. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm going to limp into the other room and get my Greek. Sounds good. Sounds good. And meanwhile, um, Kathy Graham, will you read this fatherly admonition, the end here, uh, starting with verse 14? Or who hasn't read that I haven't called on? Pat, can you read it? Yes, I can. Okay, 14 through 21. I am not writing this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you might have been 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Indeed, in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I appeal to you then, 
be imitators of me. For this reason, I sent you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ Jesus, as I teach them everywhere in every church. But some of you, thinking that I am not coming to you, have become arrogant. But I, I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of those arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God depends on talk, not on talk, but on power. What would you prefer? Am I to come to you with a stick or with love in a spirit of gentleness? Mm, what a great, great message, huh? Mm -hmm. So Paul putting on his pastor's hat in, uh, in verse 14. I'm not writing to you to make your shame but to admonish you as my beloved children. And I think that, you know, I, I, most of us here have, have raised children, and children very frequently respond to admonishment. You know, very frequently, they, when, when they go a bit too far and you correct them, they, they, they get that. Now, not always, but in, in many ways, it's surprising how uh, kids almost want you to be, I don't want to say hard on them, but they want some kind of goal, some kind of challenge. Kitty, you're a teacher for many years. Is there any truth to that? Yeah, I think they, that people need limits sometimes, and you need to know the structure of your limits. So kids mm -hmm. do <clears throat> appreciate sometimes when they are admonished, that, but they almost expect it. I'm thinking of a time when Kristen told me about three weeks ago, she entered her son's bedroom after his nap time, and the first words he said to her were, I think I'm in trouble. <laughs> because <laughs> Because he'd written all over the wall and stuff. <laughs> he knew, you know, and she was properly admonished. He told him, I love you, but we can't be doing this again. Right, right, right. right. But they, they know. And so they like it that you're even paying attention to them to admonish them. Because there are some kids that parents never say anything to. So, yeah. you know, difficult. Right, right. Many times... <laughs> Because it's uh, admonishing somebody's difficult, and I know that's why I don't say it. Is I'm like, ah, I don't want to cause the hassle. I don't want to be thought about it as a bad dad or something like that. But um, Paul says, I'm not writing this to you to make you ashamed, but because I want you to come to a better place. Uh, for though you might have ten thousand guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. Indeed, in Christ, I became your father. And so uh, when people say, well, why do we call you father? Well, you ask Paul, right? Uh, he's the one who says, I became your father through the gospel. And verse 16, I just absolutely love. I appeal to you then, be an imitator of me, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, this, this takes, a, you know, this is, again, that fine line between, you know, confidence and arrogance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and Paul, I think, I mean, from, from the way I read Paul, he's doing this in a very long, because he's coming from a place of servants, uh, of service. I mean, Paul did not come to them in a Rolls Royce. Uh, he came to them in, in, in rags, in, in humble, you know, uh, stature, and he admonishes them from a, from a place of humble um, uh, if, if, direction and not in a place of, of, of you know, uh, rich in power, rich in, you know, in, in, in possessions. Um, I think he, he has earned the street cred to be able to say this. Um, one of the, uh, I went to a talk uh, last year and it was by a guy, I shared the story in, in church at one point, uh, who was uh, the, the, the head finance guy for Enron when they got into trouble, okay? And he's, he's, he's the only one uh, in, in the C-suite, uh, the only one of the executives to have admitted that he did something wrong. Um, he was also one of the guys who went to jail. Um, a lot of them went to jail. And when, the first thing he did when he got to jail is, 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 is he said, uh, okay, uh, I'm, in, I'm not in jail, prison. I'm in prison. I'm going to be here for a little bit. Uh, I'm scared. I don't know what is expected of me. There's a pecking order. And so he went to the guard and he goes, what's the job everybody hates? And he goes, oh, clean the bathroom. And he goes, would you assign me to clean the bathroom for my entire stay? And so he took the job. Jack, no, Jack, get down from there. He's, uh, he's trying to climb the stairs. Uh, uh, thanks, mom. Uh, it, 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 and so he, he, he volunteered to clean the bathrooms for his entire stay. Well, nobody touched him his whole stay because he took the most humble job and people, you know, respected him for doing that. And I think Paul is coming from a similar place that he has um, earned a way to be, uh, to be imitated because of this humility.
Uh, verse 17, for this reason, I sent you Timothy, he's my beloved faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of the ways in Christ Jesus as I teach them everywhere in the church. Um, so he's sending Timothy uh, for, you know, to do his humble work. Uh, and then verse 19, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I'll find you not in the talk. Remember, he's writing this letter from Ephesus. He's warning that he's going to be coming to them soon. And what's he going to be coming to them doing? Well, uh, you know, it seems to me that he's going to come to admonish them, right? Um, he doesn't want to make them ashamed. He simply wants to, quote, unquote, admonish them. What does that mean? Um, and, and verse 20, he kind of unpacks it. For the kingdom of God depends not on talk, but on power. And what would you prefer? Do I come to you with a stick? Or with love and a spirit of gentleness, which would you like better? Spirit of gentleness. Yes. Really. Exactly. This is what we are to be about, is we are to be about um, coming to people, not to beat them up, but of course to uh, to come to them with the spirit of gentleness. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I just think this gives so much uh, illumination into what kind of leader Paul was into what kind of a, um, uh, a, uh, a church he was hoping to, to, to establish. And I, I don't know about you, but I mean, I've, I've just gotten the idea that Paul is, um, is giving, giving his all, uh, not in, 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 in a proud way, but in a very honest way, to say, this is how I'm making my way. This is obviously you know, what I think of the Christian message. And I'm making this sacrifice for you. What do you guys get out of this tone? Well, it shows that he's showing God's love for everybody. You know, I mean, you, you don't know what's in anybody's heart. I don't care who they are. They could be living with you and you really don't know. <coughs> you think you do, but, mm -hmm. but God knows. And it's, it's a whole different viewpoint from his perspective. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, any other final thoughts as we wrap it up for this, this edition of 1 Corinthians? Do you think Paul allowed himself to feel some disappointment in what happened? That they, I mean, I, I think it's beautiful that he, and I like the final one in my, to come to you with a stick or with love and spirit of gentleness. I think it's beautiful. But do you think he felt some disappointment? You know, that's a, such a great question, Janet, because um, if he did get disappointed, it would mean he had taken some pride in them, right? Uh, and, and Paul is going to preach over and over and over again about pride. Um, but I think so. I mean, there's the humanity of Paul comes out here, too. Uh, yeah. We're going to see that later in this letter, is he was okay. very good as well. And um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think he, he was, you know, he was very human in his, uh, uh, but he was sold out for Christ. And I think... Yeah anything away from this as we uh as we, we finish our time together um we are to be as committed to jesus and committed to the call of christ on our lives and committed to building up the saints in the faith that that paul was um that you know jesus may be our all in all and so i want to leave you today with a prayer you know as you know i've been kind of writing a prayer a day and so uh, i want to uh, pray this one which is a prayer for perspective the lord be with you with you. Yeah. Almighty God, who sees all things in perfect perspective, help us focus on the big picture, quit sweating the small stuff. As COVID-19 threatens lives and health, businesses and employment, relationships and peace of mind, give us a sense of your guiding hand. Remind us that you are working in us and through us. Help us see anew the value of each moment and give us your point of view which assures us that we are loved and accepted and worthy, that somehow, some way, all will be well, because all we see, have, and need is found in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, Bible studiers, we'll see you later. Newcomers, welcome. <laughs>